You're familiar with kinetic energy and the equation that says anytime an object's in motion, it has a form of mechanical energy that can be calculated as one half mass times velocity squared. Well, we haven't stated it as such, but this is an equation for finding what we call the translational kinetic energy of an object. The translational kinetic energy of an object is the energy associated with the motion along a line. So when the object moves from point A and has displaced some displacement D to point B, we say it is translated from point A to point B and the kinetic energy that it has as it moves with some velocity between those points is one half mv squared. Well for an object that rolls If the top of the wheel is located here at one moment, and by the time the wheel is traveled from point A to point B, if that spot ends up located here, then the object has both translated and rotated as it's moved from point A to B. So it has a total energy that's equal to the sum of its translational kinetic energy plus its rotational kinetic energy. So we're going to focus on this quantity rotational kinetic energy and we'll start by taking a look at an object known as a flywheel. Think of a flywheel as just a very large heavy disk spinning rapidly about an axis that passes through its center of mass. So the entire flywheel has a steady angular velocity of omega. This is an energy storage device. You could engage some sort of a gear that swings over and makes contact. And if these two um, surfaces rub against each other, then you can decrease the angular velocity of the larger flywheel as you increase the angular rate of the smaller wheel. So whether or not we tap in to the available energy of the flywheel or not, a flywheel that just spins freely on its axis has an energy that we can think of as a collection of translational kinetic energies of all these little pixelated components that make it up. So if we were to try to build a flywheel out of Lego or something like that, um, you'd have perhaps one piece that sits at a value of R number one, a small radius from the axis of rotation, and then maybe there'd be another Lego piece that sits farther away at R number two. If we take an aerial view of this, the axis of rotation is at the center of mass, and there's one bit of the total mass. So if we say the whole flywheel has a total mass, capital M, then each of these little bits that make it up have some small amount of mass, we'll call dm. So there are two dm values. One of them, sitting close to the axis, moves with velocity number one, and the one farther away moves with the greater velocity number two. As we saw in our last uh, lecture, linear speed for an object that moves around in a circle can be calculated by multiplying the angular speed times the radius. So for an object that sits at a greater radius, it will have a larger tangential velocity, even though all the objects have the same angular velocity. So the velocity of particle number one is omega times r1. And the velocity of dm number two is equal to omega times r number two. So let's find the little bit of kinetic energy due to these two uh, little pieces of mass. The whole flywheel has a total rotational kinetic energy K, but each one of these little bits just has a fraction of that total kinetic energy. In fact, the bit that sits right at the axis, I suppose, has a little bit of uh, rotational kinetic energy equal to zero. So dK number one would be equal to one-half times dm times omega r number one squared. One-half times mass times speed squared. And the little bit of kinetic energy associated with the object that's farther from the center 
is one half times dm times omega r number two squared. So we could find the total rotational kinetic energy by adding up all the little bits of kinetic energy for each of these pixels. That means the rotational kinetic energy of the flywheel is equal to the integral of one half dm times omega r quantity squared. <clears throat> but every bit, as we say, has a different value of r, but they would all have the same value of omega. So we'll pull out of the integral any values that are constant, and the rotational kinetic energy then of our flywheel is one half times omega squared. This means both the omega and the r get squared. So one half omega squared times the integral of r squared dm. So we can see this is two parts of the equation, and I notice that this looks something like the equation for translational kinetic energy, which if we express it the right way, would say one half v squared times just m. And we have another name for mass. We often call that inertia. So, similar, similar. So what does all this represent? We'll refer to this as rotational inertia. Some people call that moment of inertia. Those two phrases mean the same thing. Moment of inertia or rotational inertia can be used interchangeably. In fact, we'll define a variable for this. We'll say capital I represents rotational inertia, and we'll define it to be equal to the integral of r squared dm. If we do that, then we notice this is just the quantity I, rotational inertia. So we can say that rotational kinetic energy is equal to one-half times omega squared times I, or better yet, one-half I omega squared, and that looks strikingly similar to our equation for translational kinetic energy, one-half m v squared. So back to a disk or some round object that rolls across a flat surface. As it translates with the speed v, this object with a total mass of m has some translational kinetic energy, one-half m v squared, but the object is also rotating about its center as it moves from point A to point B, and so it has some rotational kinetic energy, and the disk has a rotational inertia, an angular speed omega. V is equal to omega times R, by the way. The rotational kinetic energy is one-half I omega squared, so we can say the total kinetic energy of a rolling object is the sum of its translational plus rotational kinetic energies, which is one-half mv squared plus one-half i omega squared.